see if it works. Welcome, everybody, and good morning. Uh, assuming you're in some time zone where it's still morning. Uh, uh, this is Stuart Ellis, founder and CEO of Charter School Capital. I'm here with Mike Morley, American Charter Development, and uh, we're here to talk to you about uh, facilities options for charter schools. Uh, and uh, very happy to have everybody with us today. Um, today we're going to walk through uh, and talk to you about whoops, uh, these wonderful children. And uh, uh, and I, I I want you to understand that uh, it's an honor and privilege to have. Uh, Mike Morley with us today. Um, he's uh, really an amazing expert on charter school development and uh, uh, real estate and facilities for charter schools all across the country. Mike has uh, done more uh, development projects for charters across the country than really any other organization um, that's been out there supporting charters over the last few years. So, uh, Mike, welcome. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your uh, experience for those listening out there today and uh, and joining us, that'd be great. Great, it's it's great to be with you guys. Uh, we also work with Charter School Capital and appreciate them and their role in the charter school market. We started years ago in the charter school world when it was pretty pretty much an infant in uh, in the development world. My experience goes back to 1980 when we started uh, construction and development and. Uh, we started in, in, into charter schools in the early 2000s and have been in business, uh, the business of helping promote school choice and, and provide facilities for charter schools for the past 13, 14 years. And uh, in that time, we've, we've seen a, a lot of different structures. We've developed a lot of different structures to help schools obtain facilities and I think that's really the key. There's not really a one size fits all in this market. It really is a unique uh, uh, market and it's unique from state to state. And I think that uh, as we go through this presentation, we can talk a little bit about the options that some of you, uh, your listeners have. That sounds great. Um, <clears throat> as most of you know, Charter School Capital has been funding charter schools uh, since 2007. Uh, to date, uh, we've invested and funded over 500 charter schools serving more than a half a million students. And uh, in our history, we've now invested over a billion dollars uh, in charter schools across the country. Um, we operate now in uh, 14 states and uh, continue to grow and expand, supporting the growth of um, school choice and high quality charter schools across the country and project, the challenges of balance, balancing, you know, the, the dream facility with uh, budget realities, um, getting approved for funding, the key areas for everybody to focus on regardless of the uh, finance or funding structure you're pursuing, um, project execution and timing, and, and some other thoughts we have as we roll through this. Um, and, and don't worry about taking screenshots of the material. Um, today that the presentation is available for download uh, at slideshare.net slash charter school capital and uh, you can uh, get the presentation share it with others um, so all the material you see here today uh, is available and of course uh, at the end contact information is available for uh, Mike and for me and and you can follow up with with us and our organization to the extent you have follow-up questions Throughout the presentation, we um, will take questions and we'll try to address them as we go along. We may not specifically call out that we're answering a question, but um, uh, historically, these discussions that we've had are uh, pretty interactive. We get a lot of questions and we try to cover them as we go. 
So with that, um, what's going on in the market? Uh, as, as many of you have experienced, uh, access to facilities is, is one of the biggest obstacles to growth for charter schools across the country. Um, despite the fact that today, 3 million plus students attend charter schools in the now, I think, 44 states, if you include uh, District of Columbia, um, there are over a million students uh, and families on waiting lists. Um, and uh, despite the fact that there are now 7,000 approximately charters uh, in the U.S., most uh, of those schools still have uh, suboptimal facilities or um, facilities that constrain, that constrain growth. Um, but today, there are more and more financing options available, and um, our hope is charters can ex continue to expand enrollment to serve those on the waiting list and uh, serve um, territories and regions that uh, don't currently have the best public school options. Um, uh, given all the flexibility of the, of the now more and more money that's flowing into the charter school movement. Um, today, in general, in the finance world, money is cheaper than it's been, but that is changing rapidly. Um, rates are rising across the country, and uh, at least in the U.S., though the global economy is still um, neutral rates are rising as the Federal Reserve has raised rates recently and continues to look like they're going to do that. Um, as such, there are opportunities or, or things that schools should be thinking about um, considering locking in some long-term rates and or potentially if you're in something or, or you have an opportunity to acquire the facility from your landlord, um, refinancing uh, may be very attractive right now in terms of uh, locking in some rate for the long haul, <clears throat> given today's rates. All those things vary, of course, depending on your situation. Um, whether you're uh, an individual school, very early stage, or you're a charter management organization or ed education management um, organization with multiple schools, you have different options. Refinancing or expanding may uh, carry with it different uh, financing solutions. And thinking about which Mike and I are going to talk about in a few minutes, uh, long-term lease versus some tip, more traditional bank funding or the bond market that everybody hears so much about. Um, we're going to talk through some of those options as we go through this. Mike, thoughts on what's going on in the current market? Well, the market is growing still in the charter school world. There are some states that uh, are more aggressive than others, but uh, you're right in that there are a lot of different options available to different or to schools depending on their their position and how much maturity they have in the marketplace. Certainly, we hear a lot about bonding and and in appropriate areas that's uh, that's a a good option. But there are also a lot of things to consider with regard to bonding that we'll probably get into in a little bit. But uh, many have heard of of uh, other types of funding like the EB-5 programs and and uh, lease backs and bank financing and all of those have positives and, and negatives that uh, we'll also get into. But I think that uh, what you have talked about with uh, the waiting lists and the demand for charter schools are are all accurate. But again, every individual location is going to be different and so depending on the location, demand may vary and uh, facility options may also uh, be, be varied in those areas. So be cautious <laughs> when you get into those areas. Let's talk a little bit about the, the uh, different structures for uh, funding for your facilities. Um, as, a, as you uh, seek the perfect facility for your charter school, there are a number of things to consider from a financing standpoint. Uh, the first is that uh, partially because of the, uh, the, the prevailing American dream of everybody wants to own their own home and, and things like that, a lot of school leaders um, believe that uh, they need to or want to own um, uh, their own facility. Um, and, and one note, we want to differentiate here for everybody between ownership and control. 
if you're running a school, having total control of your facility is absolutely critical to maintain stability, growth, financial predictability, et cetera. You don't have a chance to build out what you want necessarily, and um, you may have to move all the time, and you don't really have control of that facility, and that's a trade-off. Um, on the other hand, you can accomplish control via a long-term lease or financing that supports your ownership, but ownership is not required for you to maintain that control. Um, Ownership instead is an investment in real estate. And there are parties out there that are interested in investing in real estate um, that believe because of the financing they can access that uh, it's a good investment. Um, but for a school operator, uh, it really is about control and then minimizing the total dollar spent on having that control of your facility. So I uh, just wanna distinguish between these two factors they are in fact very different ownership and control. And then as you look at the annual operating cost of, uh, associated with the facility, please evaluate the dollars you're spending every year, which is what you pay teachers with and support your academic program, programs, not the advertised percentage rates. <clears throat> rates can be very misleading, um, uh, but it is about the dollars you're spending, whatever the rate is. Uh, another consideration is that um, the cost of entering into a program or uh, retaining and maintaining your facilities is not just the money, but also the time and opportunity costs for you and the management team. Um, uh, some financing structures have a high risk of uh, failure. That is, you know, it may take six to 12 months for you to get it in place, and there's a risk it never happens. You need to consider that when you move forward with something since you could get there and have uh, uh, terminated or be moving from one facility, and if the other one's not gonna be ready or uh, the financing falls apart, you could be sitting there with no school at all to operate in, which is really all scenarios. Um, and then finally, uh, you have to review the, the contractual obligations, covenants, and constraints associated with any of these options um, because they can impact your ongoing operations or the options you have for the future in terms of expansion, growth, or the ability to uh, uh, move into uh, new and better facilities. So uh, as we go forward, Mike, any other thoughts before we drop into comparing these different um, structures? Yeah, I'd just like to chime in and say that it really is about stability and and control. Obviously, a 501c3 is a not-for-profit organization, and actual ownership of that for a 501c3 doesn't mean a whole lot. It, uh, it takes, through a bond program, 30 years to pay it off, typically, and by the time you get uh, into that uh, 15 or 20 years you're going to remodel or expand, you'll probably never really own it. So the real issue are the terms uh, that uh, you have with with a lease or with the bond with financing of any kind and the stability that it gives you to stay in your facility to grow your facility and to be uh, comfortable in your facilities and when you're dealing with partners like charter school capital or ACD you want to look for somebody that's got a track record that actually has some experience and and can perform and has the ability to provide the services that uh, they're, they're telling you about. Nothing is more disruptive and, dis and uh, disconcerting in the charter school world to get uh, to a place where you think you've got a facility al arranged for and then have somebody uh, pull the rug out from under you. And so it's important that you can, you know, as you're trying to run your curriculum, as you're trying to put your school programs together that you can depend on your facilities and have uh, a, a good team player with you or partner with you in those in that uh, endeavor thanks so <coughs> these 
think about it, one of the challenges as you look at the different facilities options out there for you and the financing uh, that may be available is balancing this, you know, what can we afford with what is required? It's, it's critical when you develop any kind of plan or look at any facility that um, you consider your academic mission, the growth plans in general for what's enrollment going to look like, any specialty requirements that you have for your specific program, and uh, local laws, guidelines, considerations, uh, or requirements that you may have as part of the state or local funding. And that has to be balanced against uh, what can we afford. It, it's nice to be able to think that, you know, it'd be, it'd be really cool to have gold leaf and, uh, and, and leather on all the seats and, um, and just build the Taj Mahal of uh, charter schools facilities, but the economic realities are that uh, you can't do that. Um, and understanding what you can afford while still delivering what is uh, necessary and enhances your program the most uh, is, is pretty important. We've, we've developed a simple um, uh, uh, model or tool that um, you can use just to illustrate this. Um, and, and as Mike and I go through things today, we'll talk about some of these factors. But um, on, on the chart in front of you, how much can we afford? Um, uh, this compares, given the underlying school revenues, uh, depending on your enrollment and the uh, dollars paid by the state and federal grants that you may have access to, you can take a look at this. And across the uh, horizontal axis, you can see um, the annual school revenue moving out from uh, zero, where the three lines on the chart begin, all the way out to $10 million a year. Um, and then on the, on the vertical axis, uh, you can see that uh, what's the potential project budget? How much can I afford? Um, the three different lines, uh, the, the, the green line represents 20% um, annual operating costs associated with your facilities as a percentage of your revenue. Um, the gray line is 15% and the uh, yellow or gold line is 10%. That the percentage of your revenue that you're spending on your facilities is a choice that your management team makes. Um, the other, the, the reason these three are listed is these tend to be the range that schools operate in. And, and it depends less uh, really on um, just, hey, I'd like to spend less or more. Um, it ends up being more about the environment you operate in in the state. So for example, in the state of California, most schools operate at or around the 20% level because real estate costs and the cost of building or, or accessing uh, facilities is very high relative to um, what is a relatively low um, state and local dollars per student. Um, whereas if you go to a place like uh, Ohio or Michigan or, or something, where even though the dollars per student paid on the revenue side is not much higher than or maybe around the same as California, the cost of the real estate itself, the underlying land and building is so much lower that you can actually uh, get in for a lot lower dollars um, spent on your facilities. But this gives you an idea of the range. And so if you're a school operating, let's move out across the horizontal axis to $6 million, you can see that um, for a $6 million a year school, um, uh, you could afford to spend as much as $12 million on the total project. Um, uh, once you go north of 20% uh, cost rent or debt service as a percent of revenue, you start getting into a range where anybody underwriting these projects, anybody financing or funding these, um, uh, begins to be concerned that the school won't be competitive over the long haul, that you're just spending too much on facilities and not enough on the academic program to be sustainable over the long haul. And so um, we'll get into some of those underwriting requirements in a minute, but I wanted you to all have uh, a chance to at least uh, look at this and get a feel for what can you afford as you go through things. Um, if, you're, if you move back to a $2 million a year school, uh, which may be, uh, you know, a school with just with two to 300 students um, uh, there, depending on where you are in the country, you could afford as much as $4 million to spend on your facilities. This gives you an idea of 
um, how much uh, is available to purchase, how it's financed, and, and how much you're spending each year, um, uh, we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of options for that. Mike, any other thoughts on this uh, uh, chart before we move to the details of the different uh, funding options? Yeah, you know, I think Stuart did a great job in outlining the, uh, the challenges. Location is one of the major challenges and obviously per pupil funding or, or state reimbursement rates in the different states is also a, a, a large contributor to what you can afford. But, you know, just recently we ran into a situation and this is one of the things that we deal with most of the time is trying to balance the facility costs against uh, overall revenue and operation costs, and how you hold the operation costs lower so that you can afford facilities. And that's a balancing act that the boards are going to have to do. But we ran into a school that uh, insisted on a very, very pricey piece of property. And they felt that the property would be the key driver for helping them gain enrollment. So in that situation, they were more interested in the location than they were the facility and opted to modular units as part of their uh, facilities plan in order to be able to afford the facilities by balancing the, or the lower cost of facilities and the higher cost of land. And those are the kinds of decisions that, uh, that we work with all the time and have to help with in order to stay within the parameters that I think are essential for a school to be successful. There's so many options uh, from ground up construction to finding a building and remodeling it to dealing with uh, maybe a modular campus as, as this group decided to do. Uh, and some of the <coughs> deal or some of it also depends on what kind of expansion opportunities are you growing into higher enrollment? And if so, you know, you have some upfront costs of land and things that that are going to be borne by the initial enrollment, but you want to be able to stage the construction or stage the facility growth in a way that, that allows you to be viable while you're growing into the, uh, the ultimate uh, enrollment. So those are all issues that are balanced and things that we can help with or that other professionals can help you achieve. <laughs> so, uh, thanks for that. As the as we think about the different options then that you face, uh, I want to step back for a moment and say, um, we're going to talk through four core structural options uh, that schools can think about, and we're going to evaluate them against six different categories, which uh, as you look at this page, don't be overwhelmed by uh, the detail um, here. Instead, uh, let me say that there aren't only four, there are, varying shades of, you know, gray on any of these things. Um, uh, people have, uh, Mike mentioned earlier, EB-5. Um, there are new market tax credits, rural development funds, um, uh, various different state subsidies and programs, um, federal grants. There are, there are so many different structural options that people hear about, but in the end, they really all end up with some version of these four things, which is either you have an immense amount of cash that you're sitting on um, in reserves or donations or what have you, and you don't need to finance anything, you can spend it all here. Um, uh, that's very rare, of course. Uh, most schools don't have that as an alternative, um, but I'd also say those schools that do um, typically find that that's not the ideal option anyway, which is um, uh, I had um, at a, at a uh, session at the National Conference a couple of years ago, Sabrina Ayala, um, one of our clients, uh, who's the CFO of uh, Green Dot Public Schools, um, Sabrina was saying that having experienced all these different structures and options, you know, state funding, bank financing, bond financing, long-term leases, that um, uh, they did a, a, an entire project once because they had the cash. They couldn't get anybody else to finance it, so they did it for cash. And most schools would say they could only dream of that. Uh, Sabrina said uh, to everybody in the room, that was the single worst project they ever did. It was the worst experience they ever had, 
and the worst decision they ever made. And of course, later they were able to finance it. Um, but uh, uh, e even if you have the option of doing it for cash, um, that takes away a lot of the uh, spending power and, and, and really funds that you could be investing in the academic program or other aspects of your school. That said, it is one of the options. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the second is traditional bank financing. We'll walk through that in detail. That's the bank provides a subset of the money typically, and the school comes up with some cash. The bond market where um, uh, a subset of schools in the charter school community are eligible for bond financing. And, um, and there the bond market, although there's a lot of expense and a lot of work up front to get it done, um, the bond market will typically provide 100% financing. <clears throat> and finally, um, the most common form of financing, if you want to call it that, or access to facilities uh, in the country for charter schools is provided by a, a lease. But those used to be all short-term, you know, uh, relatively less than five-year leases with charters uh, from landlords who really were not intentionally supporting charters. They just happen to have a building or facility or what have you. But today, more and more options are available to schools for long-term leases, uh, something that provides control um, comparative to, you know, the, the long-term structure of a bond, but uh, without some of the covenant burdens and other things associated with bonds. So we're going to walk through each of these structures um, uh, and and talk through comparing them against various criteria. And as a, and as a, um, I'm going to walk through these at a high level, and I'll ask uh, Mike to talk about his experience with each of these two um, with some some examples as he sees fit. But I mentioned some of the things on the cash side. So let's walk through just the criteria by, by which we're comparing all of these. Um, we're going to use for this example that you're all looking at on page 12, um, a $7 million project. And for a $7 million project, if you're doing it all for cash, you got to have $7 million. Um, the annual cost of the financing going forward is, of course, zero because you didn't finance anything. Um, your underwriting requirements are, uh, hey, I feel like it. Um, you don't have to ask anybody permission. The security interest or collateral you have to post is none because it's all yours. You spent the money. It's your facility and building. Your growth options are limited by how much cash you have in the future to fund the expansion to other classrooms or other facilities you may need. And the only real major question from a cash standpoint is, do I have the cash? Um, do I have the reserves? And secondarily, as we mentioned, is do, should I really spend it on this or can I spend it on something other than facilities? As you move into uh, bank financing, which is a traditional mode of financing in, in many businesses um, and, and many real estate support options, um, the cash needed to close on a $7 million property is that you typically need to put up uh, really between 30 and 40% um, of the cash and with the bank uh, providing typically 60 to 70%. Now, there are variants on all of these. There are some banks that might do as much as 80% or, or so, uh, depending on how old the school is, what have you. But, but typically you're looking at banks providing 60% to 70% of the funds. As a result, you need two to $3 million of cash in order to enter into that option. As a result, this is typically not an option available to most schools, but to the extent you did, um, the annual cost is uh, $350,000 to $700,000, depending on how much you're financing and the underlying rate. The rates here are assumed to be um, 6 to 8%, uh, though, uh, of course, things range all over the map, depending on how much uh, uh, cash or equity the school is putting up, how long the financing is. From an underwriting standpoint, most banks will not support a school that has been in operation less than five years. Um, the evaluation of how much funding you'll get is a function of your surplus, or even though you may be a nonprofit, you're, you're basically your uh, profitability as an organization. Um, and then the value of the underlying land and property, your assets uh, and revenue available. The bank will require as collateral all the real estate. Um, they'll have a claim on that. And 
all the revenue and assets of the school that will be restricted. Um, as you look forward and think about things going forward, growth options really are, if I want to expand and I need more money later, there's a risk that that same bank that said yes originally may not want to refinance the school down the road or the market may have changed from a regulatory environment and the banks may not be interested in general in financing charter schools. And of course, you have uh, some cost or rate risk down the road. Um, we would mentioned some of these other things, but the last thing I'd mention here is the overall term of the loan from the bank is not usually as long as the bond market where uh, things might be 30 years or the long-term lease options that are available where schools can get as much as 30 to 40 years. Um, the main consideration here is if the amortization on a loan, uh, which is the time you have to pay back the underlying principal, um, those tend to be as long as 20 years, but often much shorter coming from a bank, and they may really be more like five to 10 years. As a result, in addition to paying the underlying interest, you also have to pay back the principal during that period, or you may have some um, significant balloon payment down the road, uh, which could put the school at risk if you can't refinance. So that's the bank option in a nutshell. Mike, any comments on the banks before we move, move to uh, bonds and, and long-term lease? Yeah, we've actually had uh, schools who have done bank financing come back to us uh, a year later and, and uh, ask us to uh, provide them a different option, a, a lease-back program, so that they can get their cash back out of the facility and in, invest it or deploy it differently. So there are some, there are those who uh, do very well. There are programs by uh, the USDA for rural areas that uh, are killer for schools that uh, qualify. But in general, uh, a bank loan is going to have a five to 10 year uh, call, even if it does have a 20 to 25 year amortization. And you know how volatile interest can be over a five to 10 year period. So at that call time, interest might be a much different uh, factor than it is today. So there's, there's a lot of things to consider when looking at uh, bank financing. Uh, really good point. That the, one of the <clears throat> particular points about that call option is that um, even though, to Mike's point, the amortization may be 20 to 25 years, which, which reduces your annual payments, um, having the risk that the bank could just call a term loan uh, at the five to 10 year point can be very concerning for a school, given that you may be sitting there saying, hey, I don't have the funds to pay it off. You essentially are forced to refinance, but you don't know what the market will be like once you get out there. Well, just consider the banking situation in 2008. In 2000, 2007, all of us were kind of feeling like bank financing was the, the end all best way to go. You didn't need a lot down. Banks were free with money. And uh, 2008 hit and all the requirements changed and banks were dumping loans and trying to get uh, you off. Uh, even if you had a loan with them, <clears throat> they uh, used a number of different methods to, uh, to get you out of their portfolio because they were too heavily invested in real estate or something else or the bank failed. And so, you know, there was a real shakeup and confidence in, in uh, banks uh, took a real hit during that last recession in 2008 timeframe. Anybody who wants to experience the stress associated with that period, go see the big short. Um, so uh, <clears throat> uh, that said, that's, that period that Mike's talking about is right when charter school capital was launching. So I experienced the stress associated with all that uh, very personally. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the bond market. Um, so uh, bond market, the, the, or the bond option for schools uh, is an interesting option. Um, it's interesting because uh, if you go to, if you're a charter school leader and you go to uh, a, a charter school conference uh, around the country, what you'll find is the most prevalent um, source of financing or what appears to be the most common kind of financing is bond financing. Um, there are at any given show or conference 10 to 20 bond brokers uh, at any uh, particular uh, conference um, offering their wares to the charter school market. Um, that said, the, one of the reasons I find this so interesting is 
fewer than 9% of the charter schools in the country uh, in, in the history of the charter school market have been financed via the bond market. Um, so you would think that everybody had bond financing, but only 9% of the schools have accessed it, either because uh, it's difficult or the schools, once they get into it, don't want it, or because the criteria, as noted here on the underwriting side, um, are, are difficult and, and frankly, uh, a lot of schools simply don't qualify. But from an access standpoint, what are the things needed uh, to be in the um, uh, bond market? The first is that um, you will need to spend um, up two to five hundred thousand dollars, regardless of the size of the bond, whether you're doing twenty million or five million or or uh, what have you, just to get things prepared to go pitch bond market investors. Um, and there's no guarantee that you'll get funded at that point, but that's cash that you'll need upfront to get rolling typically. Um, in addition, there will be greater obligations to the lawyers, uh, brokers, uh, expenditures on uh, potential architectural plans, designs, uh, engaging various service providers um, which you may not have to spend up front, but if the bond fails to fund or close, um, which is a risk, the school will still be on the hook for all those expenditures, and those uh, may be uh, closer to a million uh, than 500000 However, if the bond is successful, and you get it, the annual cost of the bond um, will end up being uh, about twice that of the, or, or uh, depending on the amount funded with the bank, Six to eight hundred thousand is the annual cost of, of what we're talking about here—a seven million dollar project. Um, now, with that, you're getting a hundred percent financing instead of sixty to seventy percent financing, so you actually have more dollars uh, that you're borrowing, um, and you have a longer amortization period, typically some thirty years. Um, from an underwriting standpoint, again, the bond market very rarely will finance anything less than three years. Uh, of operation, and typically they're going to want closer or more like five years plus. Um, commonly, they would like to see a school that has had one charter renewal. Um, they will evaluate debt coverage ratios. Again, your surplus matters. And really what they're looking for is, can you afford with the excess funds thrown off after paying for all your operations, uh, your academic program, et cetera, um, to pay the uh, principal back and the interest on an annualized basis. Um, and there's a consideration around whether you want to get rated by the rating agencies, which will cost more upfront, but can result in a lower rate um, or borrowing cost uh, on the bond once you get into it. Like with the bank, um, all the real estate and all the assets are available uh, and required by the bondholders as collateral such that if the school uh, uh, misses payments, then uh, the bond um, uh, investors can foreclose on the school um, if payments don't come in in a timely manner. Um, your growth options are limited by um, a couple of things. One is the, the bond market will build in typically into the bond a covenant that says you are in no circumstances allowed to refinance um, in uh, in the first 10 years of the bond. As a result, if you are going to have any growth beyond the existing facility you're going to uh, build or acquire right up front with the bond, um, and it's going to occur in less than 10 years, you're going to be constrained because you won't be able to get any other form of financing, uh, nor um, uh, will you be able to exit the existing bond, even to refinance into a larger bond. Um, the, the covenants create significant restrictions on that. And of course, even if you get outside of the minimum, let's say you're in year 11 and you want to refinance to expand, uh, there you're looking at uh, the risk of whether the bond market or other forms of financing are available to support your school, um, whether there's a 2008 type great recession or situation where the banks have pulled back or where charter schools are out of fashion from a, a financing standpoint. Um, Finally, as we mentioned, 100% financing is one of the great benefits of the bond um, solution, but uh, one of the uh, costs that, that uh, organizations and management teams don't often uh, consider is the roadshow. You have to go out with the bond brokers to pitch investors 
Um, it takes a lot of time to prepare materials up front uh, and support a bond offering. You will typically have to meet with a lot of potential investors or the brokers or uh, the salespeople marketing um, your financing. Uh, and that takes a lot of time. And finally, um, uh, beyond the seven million for your facility, um, transaction costs tend to be 15 to 20% of whatever the solution is um, in the cost paid to the brokers, the lawyers, uh, and then in interest reserves and other things that you have to maintain, which is all money you end up financing into the bond, uh, driving up your cost, but actually have nothing to do with the facility you're acquiring. Um, now, I, a, a lot of the concerns we're, we're talking about for the bonds, I don't, I don't want to overstate them. Um, frankly, if you're a mature organization, um, you have settled on the perfect facility, you're not going to grow or expand down the road. Um, the bond market can provide very stable financing if you can enter into it. It's long-term, 30 years. Um, and while it's, it's no uh, more or less necessarily ownership than a long-term lease, um, it is an option that can prevent or present stable long-term costs um, if it works for your organization given your future plans uh, and it's something you can get approved for. Mike, you want to uh, touch on the, the bond uh, solution? Sure. <clears throat> We've had significant experience in the bond markets and uh, have helped a number of schools refinance uh, through bond uh, proceeds. But this really is a case, as Stuart had indicated, that we need to look at the rate, not just the rate, but the effectual rate. Um, we've had some very successful schools who have gotten great rates and have uh, been able to negotiate limited uh, uh, reserves and uh, been able to kind of keep their issuance costs down. But we've also seen the, the opposite. In fact, I'm aware of one school that we helped <clears throat> a couple of years ago who went through this process and we were uh, when we underwrote them, we thought that they could afford about a $6 million facility. They'd been in business some time, and uh, we introduced them to a bonding group uh, who basically came in and said, what, what are your dreams here? What do you want to see? Oh, man, that uh, stimulates the creative juices, and all of a sudden, they've got all kinds of things that they want. So they ended up uh, with an eight and a half or nine million dollar facility, which equated in this particular case because of the reserves that Stuart had mentioned earlier uh, to a twelve and a half, thirteen million dollar bond. They had built in a number of, of reserves and, and uh, they didn't even pay any, uh, any payments on the bond for a year or two which also caused them to be a little bit flippant about their, their saving and about uh, keeping cost control. And they just declared uh, bankruptcy this past uh, month or so because of the issue. And now the operator is very upset and blaming the bonding company for having gotten them into a financial mess. <clears throat> In other cases, very good guidelines have been followed, and uh, particularly in states where incentives are given by the state for moral obligation incentives or bonuses that help bring the rates down, bonds can be a, a great tool. And even for expansion, uh, if you have good advice and if you work with uh, the right people, you can have parity bonds or other things that uh, are options to help in the future, but you need to know that it's not a panacea and it's certainly not an end all or the best or, or, you know, it may be your best option, but it's not always the best option. And so you just need to have good advice and work with people who understand what your plan is for growth, what your plan is for your facility needs and help guide you into the best solution for you because the best solution for you may not necessarily be the best solution for someone else. Thanks. So uh, the last core option is uh, actually more and more prevalent in the market today and that is the long-term lease. Um, uh, this really didn't, use, didn't exist for charters uh, until about five years ago and of course there, there were a smattering of these available but now there are uh, programs available with 
investors interested in um, having the real estate in a broad portfolio um, that can provide schools control, um, future growth options, and, and are interested in supporting charter schools over the long haul. Uh, as such, you can now enter into leases that are um, 20, 30, 40 years long if you want, or 20 years with renewal options to the school, what have you, that give you flexibility, but allow the school to maintain control. And uh, for uh, the long-term lease options, and, and I, I want to distinguish between this and a landlord who has an empty building or, you know, it, it, a, a lot of schools may uh, lease space from uh, a, a, a local a former Catholic church or something like that, where there used to be a school there and they're no longer operating the school and they, they take a charter in. Um, and those leases tend to be shorter term. They might be, you know, two or three years and then you don't know what's going to happen. This is a different option. This is a, an option where you're there for the long haul uh, if you want it. Um, and something like this, uh, there is really very little, if any, cash needed to close. Um, you may have to identify the property or what have you, but it can be as little as zero. Um, the, the funding source uh, or eventual uh, landlord or property holder um, on behalf of the school uh, generally puts up all the funds for that. Um, and and this is an option as a result that that really is uh, uh, very low cost for the school to enter. Um, the annual costs um, in this case are very similar to that of the bond. It provides 100% financing like the bond market. Um, unlike the bond market, there's no amortization uh, what to get whatsoever. You're not paying back the principal. You're just paying the ongoing lease rate, which tends to be about the same as a bond, even though the rate may appear higher because you're not paying over time uh, the principal or paying back. This is really similar to a kind of an interest only loan. Um, uh, there are investors in this space don't necessarily have minimum academic requirements or minimum years that you could fund a school in year zero um, or which which uh, Mike and American Charter Development do often, or in its first year of operations, charter school capital funds schools across the spectrum. Um, and and uh, American Charter Development and Charter School Capital, we all deploy, you know, options across this entire spectrum and many others helping schools with whatever makes the most sense. But the long-term lease tends to be um, uh, most flexible. The security interest, unlike having the real estate and all assets committed, there isn't any, there's no collateral provided by the school. Now, you, the, the uh, property holder owns the land uh, and the building, but the school uh, contractually has the right to be there forever, basically, um, if that's what's negotiated. And uh, so long as you're making your payments, then you have access to it. But there's no other claim on the revenues of the school. This option tends to be scalable and expandable more than any of the others. Um, for the following reason, somebody asked um, one of the questions we've had, which we've been trying to touch on as we go. Uh, one of the uh, listeners today um, uh, asked about financing tenant improvement uh, in a long-term lease environment. Um, in a long-term lease, you're typically, if you're dealing with somebody like Charter School Capital or American Charter Development, we're interested in supporting the school overall. And so if there's a program that's already operating, you want to expand, add additional tenant improvements, build additional classrooms, add a gymnasium or what have you. If you've got a school that can sustain that, you have the enrollment to support it, or things have already been going well, expansion options are just the landlord uh, or property holder investing further in what's already a successful project. So that tends to be um, uh, much more common here. The restrictions associated with the bond market or the bank financing uh, are not as prevalent here. Um, these parties tend to have um, uh, access to much more flexible money and funds, um, don't have to go ask permission, um, you know, uh, or go through many layers of credit committees, et cetera, and so approval tends to be easier. Um, and, and the other alternative here is that for things like uh, uh, FF&E or furniture and, and other equipment or technology, um, working capital is available. Um, uh, charter school capital started uh, originally the financing that we provided to school was schools were for 
working capital financing. And so those things are available uh, as programs uh, separate and apart from the real estate, you could get funding for some of these other items uh, associated with the move or the transition that might not be covered by the other markets. The bond market and the banks are, tend to do things that are supported by the underlying real estate uh, and the ongoing income stream of the school. Um, a long-term lease, lease option can work in tandem with other forms of financing uh, to provide capital up front for the school to market to enrollment or hire teachers early or uh, what have you. Uh, Mike, do you want to um, uh, add anything on, on the long-term uh, lease? Yeah, actually, that was uh, the area that we got into first. We were in the first in the country to offer it. In fact, uh, some of the groups that uh, <clears throat> some of the charter school groups that uh, saw our first offerings were baffled. My experience uh, before charter schools and in um, other industries is, was long-term leases to uh, either credit tenants or federal and state agencies. And so we would often, and we're aware of you know, an RFP or request for proposal coming in, we would put together a package for say the USDA or for the uh, Bureau of Land Management or some state agencies, and we would bid a lease rate back to them for long-term leases because federal and state agencies often don't want to own. So it was a natural thing for me when I was sitting in the legislature some years ago, back in the about 2002, 2003, to think of how we could help charter schools to be able to prolificate in our, in our state and how to support them because we knew they didn't have construction and development resources. First thing that came to mind was long-term leases uh, that would help them to be able to uh, support their growth and enrollment while uh, providing them the services they needed. And so the first one we did uh, was here in Utah, and it was a 100% uh, finance with a, a, a long-term lease. And at that time, we didn't have purchase options because that wasn't contemplated until later. But uh, it really is an effective way for a startup school to obtain facilities and uh, do so in a, in a very effective way. All of the headache of finance then becomes that of someone else, whether they use EB-5 or bank finance, or even we've done pooled bonds in a sub, uh, senior subordinate fashion. So we've become very innovative in how to finance schools, but we take that burden away from the schools uh, so that they're not having to focus on those very complex and difficult uh, finance structures, but they, they then have the benefit of a long-term lease that gives them the stability that you talked about while focusing on their overall uh, school program. And often we give them now uh, opportunities to purchase at certain uh, times at, or even throughout the lease if that uh, becomes something that they they are enamored with or feel like is a, uh, a positive thing for their school. And sometimes it really is. Other times it's uh, more effective for, for some operators just to stay in the lease and to uh, focus on their core mission. Um, <clears throat> all right, thanks. Um, given the time frame that we have uh, remaining, Mike and I are gonna flip through some of the other materials so that you know what's here and uh, we'll comment as we go through. But I think we've given a reasonable overview here. Um, people have asked about rates. Um, there, some of the rates that are assumed here, there's a, there's a wide range, but they're listed here on, the, um, on page 15 uh, in the small print when you download the presentation later uh, the, of what was available in this example. They range all over. If you're looking at a you know, $20 million project, that may be very different than a $3 million project. But one of the things Mike touched on there that uh, people should understand is uh, the benefit of dealing with an organization um, like ours collectively or, or uh, others out there that do a lot of this is um, instead of financing your school one at a time, you can uh, take advantage of programs from providers 
uh, like American Charter or Charter School Capital that have access to broad ranges of financing in the market because we're funding, you know, 50 or 100 schools as opposed to we're funding one at a time. So as a result, we may have access to lower cost financing that we can pass through to the schools um, than you might be able to achieve uh, individually or on your own. And that's one of the reasons that the programs tend to work better and the long-term lease can be so attractive. Um, we're not gonna touch on this today, but I want you to be aware, these are some of the requirements available for uh, the bond market um, as people consider this as an option. Um, and we're happy to answer uh, questions about this and follow up um, or provide people access and support uh, for the bond market to the extent you wanna pursue that. But some of the requirements are here. Um, we're gonna skip through this. And, and at a high level, I just wanted to compare for everybody um, these, the, this is a summary of the details you just saw for two different example projects. One is five million or a smaller project. And you can see the green um, uh, circles are those where this is good or easy, um, comparing these options against the various criteria. Yellow, uh, a little more difficult, and red, either not really an option or, or uh, a, a significant disadvantage of this structure. This is a small project. The bond market tends not to be accessible to schools. You know, if you're funding a project that's five million or less, um, the cost, the transaction costs tend to be very burdensome and relatively few uh, investor programs or brokers will support uh, a bond that's this small um, just because it's not worth anybody's time. Uh, although it might be uh, worthwhile for the school, it's just not commonly available and tends to be very expensive. Um, that said, if you're doing a $20 million project, three things change. One is the bank option becomes less attractive because you have to have a lot more cash from an equity standpoint. The bond market is more attractive from an annual cost standpoint because now those transaction costs are spread over a much bigger project. Um, and growth options are a little bit better in the bond market uh, later because if you're 20 million or north, uh, you know, or, or bigger in terms of the project, more investors may be interested. And that's why organizations like American Charter Development or Charter School Capital, or some of um, the others out there, um, present some of these options to people and why long-term lease may be more attractive is um, we're able to access a lot of that financing because of our scale and we can provide those services to schools. Um, let's, let's talk uh, briefly about the, the passing the test or getting funded by anybody. There have been a number of questions during the, uh, the webinar today um, about uh, questions about the length of charter, uh, enrollment requirements, uh, and the numbers. And I want to make sure everybody is aware, whether you're looking at a long-term lease or a bond or bank financing or really anybody looking to support the school, they're going to look at the same things. Um, the first is you're going to look at enrollment. Is enrollment stable or increasing? Is there strong demand in general, either a waiting list, expanding grades, or market growth? Now, if you're a year zero school, if you haven't started yet, that's still okay. The potential for enrollment, the confidence that uh, an investor or supporter could have, whether it's bank, bond, or uh, a long-term lease, is, hey, will the school's history or the leadership's history, you know, um, is there a proven track record that gives somebody confidence that the school will be around and will be able to attract students, whether you already have them or whether you're just projecting that you'll be able to attract them from the need given the underlying market uh, is something that everybody will look at. The numbers have to pencil. We looked earlier at, you know, schools being able to afford or underwriting uh, and investor organizations looking at as much as 20% of total revenue available. Fundamentally, you have to have sound financial performance um, once the project was done. So what does the pro forma of your financials look like as you go forward? And will the underlying property that you're going to fund support that? Whether it's the combination of land and building that Mike mentioned before, you could have very heavy costs of land, but you may uh, be constrained on the building. And some uh, organizations, the bond market or uh, banks, tend to not want to fund uh, temporary facilities or modulars because they don't last as long. And uh, those organizations tend to, if you're going to have a 30-year bond, 
they want to have a building that's going to last 30 years, not have a modular that may expire or, or wear out uh, over the course of 10 years. And so, whereas uh, uh, long-term lease options may be perfectly happy doing something like that and having modulars and really not needing to convert them or still having the funds later for the school if uh, you want to convert to something more permanent. Finally, every investor will look at uh, overall governance issues, which is what's your relationship with the authorizer, whether that's the local school district or a third party authorizer or the state. Um, you know, they, their review and confidence in either schools management, the support being provided, all of this is around the likelihood of renewal of your charter or the extension of your charter because anybody investing in the real estate on your behalf, whether it's via some form of loan, bond, or uh, lease, is interested in your long-term survival and support and growth. Um, uh, and having uh, governance that, that uh, aligns with operational excellence over the long haul and your adherence to internal controls is something that tends to be pretty critical. Mike, anything about uh, just schools passing the, the test of getting funding that we'd want to add? Not really. I, I think that's one of the main things that we deal with is uh, trying to help schools understand this uh, key uh, information and underwriting them and un helping them understand what they can afford, what uh, options they may have, and how we can help them or assist them in getting into uh, an appropriate facility. You covered uh, uh, a lot of the, the issues that uh, they face enrollment, stability, academic performance, um, having some reserves, not, not trying to, uh, you know, you, you want to run it like you would hope to run your, your home budget. You want to make sure that you have some reserves, that you're not spending every dime that comes in the door, because inevitably something is going to come up that uh, is going to create a need for immediate cash. And so you don't want to be so tight that you don't have uh, any contingency funding. But I think you covered it well. So um, the, the webinar today was scheduled for an hour. We're gonna run over a few minutes. Um, we, were, we, we really appreciate everybody staying on and respect everybody's time. Um, the presentation is available to download as we mentioned. There are a few other things we wanna comment on for those of you who wanna remain on for the next few minutes. Um, the uh, one is uh, this, concept around key components of any successful project. The first is it really takes a lot of planning, whether it's a move to an already pre-existing facility or a financing program refinancing your existing facility or the ground up development uh, of a facility, planning ahead is critical and that can be as much as a year or two prior to your move. Um, it involves collaborating with the program side of your organization, the teachers, making sure everybody's on board which what, with, with what can be a very disruptive process for the school overall. The second thing is to keep an eye on the market um, in terms of financial rates and flexibility or availability of funds. As we mentioned earlier, today rates are fairly low, but they're rising, um, which is a new phenomenon in the market. Uh, you know, over the last few years, rates have been declining or relatively flat, but they've turned around now and then tend to be rising. So taking advantage of some of that to lock in long term is, is uh, potentially an opportunity and useful. Also thinking about available real estate um, uh, for your school uh, and other locations is good to consider and always be aware of. Um, making sure you have all the resources lined up in advance legal support uh, and making sure you have the financing in place and the academic program uh, is really critical. And then preparing for the deal, Mike's mentioned a number of times working with a partner that is strong, has a ton of experience in this space, particularly charter school experience and making sure you have the funds for your project in advance is really critical. The worst thing would be to you know, identify a property, be transitioning out of your existing location, um, looking at a move and all this expansion and then have the financing not be there or fall apart. Um, it can really disrupt school operations and leave uh, you, uh, uh, the families and students you're supporting um, uh, without the options that they want to pursue. Um, I'm going to skip over the ex execution for now so Mike and I can touch on a few last things, but suffice it to say, 
the program itself, the planning phase, funding overall, which we spent a lot of the time on, acquisition of the site and getting zoning and permits cleared, design and construction are all critical elements and things that have to be managed. And as we move to the last thing, I, I just ask, uh, I guess I'll ask this, anything, Mike, just uh, for a moment you'd like to add on, on those pieces beyond funding on, on the, uh, the use permits or acquisitions, design, construction that people could ch just uh, think about and be really aware of, uh, other than just making sure they have a great partner to work with? I think your, uh, your description of this particular part is, is good and it's nice to see kind of a list, but boy, it can take years in certain areas in California and even in uh, large um, metropolitan areas in North and South Carolina and elsewhere to get uh, traffic uh, sign off from st on state roads and there can be widening of roads, there can be intersections that uh, come into play. Charter schools often have a large traffic demand because of the drop off pickup and we find that uh, traffic concerns uh, are, are paramount in many developments. Uh, so traffic and environmental and uh, soils, you know, you, you look at a piece of ground and think, man, that looks like a great piece of ground. And then you find out that uh, half of it is considered wetland or has uh, large rock formations that need blasting. And so you really need professionals to help in uh, managing those real estate issues that uh, can really uh, undermine a project. Zoning is an issue and every state is different. Some states are very friendly to zoning for charter schools. Uh, other states can be very difficult. So just uh, be aware that those are definitely things to be considered and uh, to look into before you jump too, too quickly. To, to Mike's point on all of that, uh, working with somebody who's a full service resource, uh, one of our organizations, um, as an example, or others that really do everything um, on behalf of the school, uh, a f somebody who has the financing or can provide the funding and an appropriate structure, um, somebody who will uh, deal with the development issues that Mike mentioned, um, take care of the architectural design that you need and manage uh, the execution or the, the uh, act as a general contractor who can manage the execution of the project is really critical. If you're managing it all on your own at the school level and deal with one party who's financing, one party who's doing design, one party who's doing the, uh, the build out, one party who's dealing with zoning, it can be very complex, but you also end up in a situation where all those various parties as things begin to go wrong, start pointing at each other and blaming everybody for any disruption. You really want somebody who is as concerned about the success overall of getting you into your completed facility on time, on budget, um, who will be just as concerned about it as your school and just as motivated to get it all done, whatever the obstacles are that you run into in whatever area. Um, you know, Stuart, and, we find, we find uh, often that uh, charter schools will get, an, get their charter, they'll be so excited, they'll go out and engage an architect and uh, have them start putting plans together. And uh, six or seven months down the road, they find out that they have no money to pay the architect. The architect is uh, after them for collection. They're, they're, they've made uh, commitments to realtors and others to find them property but don't have the resources to take care of it. And uh, so they just kind of put the cart ahead of the horse. And so what you're saying here, I think is really important that you look at the end and see how you're gonna get there before you jump too quickly into a lot of commitments with local architects and others who will be pursuing you. I mean, they're all at the, the conferences and they're gonna be talking to you about their expertise. The issue is, how are you going to pay for it and how are you going to pull all the pieces together and you really need to have a plan to do that before you enter into contracts with um, multiple service providers. Um, the other thing uh, that's related that a lot of organizations don't think about is having access to other uh, financing, working capital or growth capital during this process. You know, you, you move into a facility that might be funded and built, now you, you have an empty building 
How are you going to get the computers, uh, technology, textbooks, new uh, furniture, desks, uh, smart boards, or other things that you might want in the ideal facility that are not typically funded by those funding the real estate? Um, and ensuring that you have access uh, to an organization, uh, whether it's um, uh, excess money in the bond, which is typically not available, or um, uh, another form of loan uh, with a bank or financing with charter school capital um, or, or another provider, a, a, a board member or some benefactor. Um, but uh, organizations like ours, there aren't many across the country, but uh, can provide that kind of additional funds for early hiring of teachers, handled expenses like the move that are not long-term funding uh, issues, but are those things that you just need to expand or or spend on early when you get in uh, that you want to make sure you have the support for so you don't end up with an empty building and how do I fill it up with the things necessary, including the students. Um, as we've gone through this, there are a number of questions that we've had. We've tried to address them. One of them uh, that uh, came up was uh, how many of these funding structures are limited to the length of the charter term? And the answer is it's really just about the risk being uh, that the investors are willing to take. for organizations that look like they have their act together and are going to be around long term. And there are things that our organizations can do that um, help charters and can support the renewal process um, and ensure that the school has the, the tools and other resources necessary to be around long term. So that tends to be a limiter that everybody cares about um, the length of your charter, but uh, it is not uh, necessarily a deal killer if you're dealing with uh, appropriate investors who really understand the charter school market and the likelihood of renewal. Um, the other thing is tenant improvements uh, on new properties or expansion properties are really the same. If you have a funding source, uh, like we mentioned, the, the working capital or growth capital options, or a source that's willing to invest to get everything set up properly, uh, tenant improvements, expansion, and other elements that might not typically be funded are fine and are fundable by the investor um, uh, if it's included as part of Um, even if you're in a rural area, if you've got a program that's successful, um, feel free to talk to us about getting that kind of program and funding. 100% um, financing is available. In certain areas for new builds um, or expansion, um, the federal government and the USDA tend to have some uh, rural development funds, some partial funding or, or uh, loans that are offered at very subsidized rates for those schools, uh, organizations that qualify in particular area that the areas that the federal government wants to um, increase development. Um, and, and finally, things like the EB-5 program, which Mike mentioned earlier, uh, those are uh, available though typically to organizations like American Charter Development um, or, or our organization who have a portfolio of schools and can access that money efficiently. Those are typically available to startup schools um, uh, because it's really a function of adding new employment uh, into the U.S. Uh, and it involves international investors uh, or people who want to immigrate to the U.S. Um, and so those those programs are not typically available to um, uh, schools that are uh, ongoing schools that are expanding a little bit because you don't increase a lot of jobs. That said, uh, I want to say that we've tried to answer all your questions as we went. Um, we ran over um, today nearly 15 minutes. Um, I really, I'm really privileged to have Mike with me today talking through this, his expertise. Uh, 
clear to those of you who've been li listening and and uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's quite satisfying and heartening to me to see that that really um, we didn't have people drop off even though we've run over 15 minutes so uh, I view that as uh, uh, some comment from all of you that the material today and and the insights from Mike um, were uh, uh, quite intriguing and things people found valuable uh, as a reminder um, you can get this presentation at slideshare.net slash charter school capital. It's available. You can contact uh, me or, or charter school capital or Mike at American Charter Development um, if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, the two of us really appreciate all of you joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to work with so many charter schools across the country. Mike, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, it was a real privilege to have you with me. And, and uh, as always, I appreciate your partnership. It was my privilege, I can assure you, and thank you. You, you did a great job of, uh, of narrating this uh, slideshow and, and providing valuable insight. Thanks. And by the way, anytime I need somebody to say what a great job I'm doing, I'll, or if I'm feeling down in general, I'll call you in the future. <laughs> I appreciate all the compliments. The feeling's mutual. Uh, th thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to uh, uh, more of these sessions in the future. Uh, Mike, thanks again, and, and with that, we'll uh, end the webinar.